Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we will have a public lecture on the topic of 3D printing, a new road to scientific aerosol instruments, from, from fast prototyping to instruments for routine measurements, which will pr be presented by the keynote speaker, Dr. Anne Mather. Uh, Dr. Maser is a research associate scientist at the Cypress Institute, where she works at the Instrumentation for Nanoparticle Synthesis and Characterization Laboratory of the Climate and Atmosphere Research Center. Her research interests are the development of lightweight and cost-efficient aerosol instrumentation and aerosol-based nanotechnology. Dr. Maser holds a PhD degree in physics from the University of Vienna, Austria. After her PhD studies, she has worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Delft University of Technology in Netherlands. In 2014, Dr. Maser earned a Schrodinger Fellowship awarded by the Austrian Science Fund to work as a research fellow at both the University of Minnesota, USA and University of Vienna. Just a kind note to everyone, questions will be accepted at the end of the presentation. I now leave the floor to Dr. Maser. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and welcome everyone to this presentation uh, on how you can use uh, 3D printing to develop scientific instruments and more specifically uh, scientific instruments uh, for uh, aerosol measurements. Um, I want to apologize in advance. I might be running out of breath occasionally because I'm now uh, about seven months pregnant and uh, somehow I don't have that much uh, space to breathe anymore, so just be patient if I need some breaks to catch my breath occasionally. So I will start this presentation uh, with a very, very um, uh, general motivation of why we want uh, to do this. Um, okay, so so um, the motivation is that uh, aerosol particles are around us uh, everywhere um, and uh, in order to understand uh, what's going on we need to, uh, to measure these particles. So aerosol particles are any kind of solid or liquid particles that are suspended in the air. These aerosol particles have uh, both anthrop anthropogenic and natural sources. Uh, which can emit um, either primary particles or gaseous precursors that can lead to the formation of particles. Those particles then can interact uh, with vapors and they get transported and um, play an important role for uh, very crucial um, uh, effects in, in, that affect uh, humans uh, a lot. And this is uh, first like air quality effects, uh, which have a, a large impact on our health, or, but also on visibility, for example. And also these particles affect the climate and they affect the climate because um, they play a major role uh, in the formation of uh, clouds, for example, but they also can uh, scatter light uh, directly. So they uh, influence the flux uh, from the sun to the earth. And um, so it's very important to understand how this uh, affects our everyday life. Uh, I want to say a bit more about the health effects. So aerosols, especially now in the pandemic, have been mentioned a lot. So I think you are all aware that um, aerosol particles uh, can have a bad effect on your health, but not only viruses uh, have effects on health, but also any kind of other particles affect your health. And that's because they can enter your respiratory system and then uh, they deposit uh, somewhere in your system and might be able to enter your bloodstream and this can be uh, potentially harmful. So where your particles would deposit in your respir respiratory system would uh, depend largely on the size of the particles. So um, while larger particles would already in, uh, deposit in your nose and then um, you remove it by sneezing, Again, um, so smaller particles might uh, reach the very deep part of your lungs, which are the alveoli, uh, and uh, they are then more easily um, entering your bloodstream. They might stay there much longer and um, so be potentially more harmful. You see this in this schematic, but the smaller particles uh, get more deep into the lungs. 
And this kind of health effects uh, can be kind quite uh, severe. So um, from the World Health Organization, it's estimated uh, that um, airborne particles might cause 8% uh, of the to total global mortality. This is a source from 2016. And that's because these particles can cause uh, several very uh, serious diseases and uh, therefore cause uh, the loss of um, years in life in humans. And this is why it's also important to measure these very small particles. Um, my apologies, Dr. Maser, for interrupting. Uh, I think the um, a link to a uh, live stream through YouTube has to be uh, activated from your side. Okay, how, how do I do that? Uh, Pandelis, are you here? Yes, yes, what do you need? Uh, for the live streaming, can you please uh, uh, help us on this? Unfortunately, I don't have the key to start it. I have already started from my side, but uh, it needs to be started uh, from CYI. Uh, okay, but this is recorded at the moment, so it should be fine. Yes, it is. Uh, it's been recorded since the very beginning. Okay. 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 So I, I just you. continue. Yes, of course. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So um, now I want to talk a little bit more about aerosol particles because they can um, come in a very large variety of uh, sizes, shapes, and uh, chemical composition. And uh, so they span from about one nanometer to about 10 micrometers over five orders of magnitude. And they might be like soup particles, smoke particles, mineral dust, uh, bacteria, pollen, and so on. And uh, because of this uh, large variety, it's um, not so easy to measure uh, aerosol particles. So you would not find a single instrument that could measure all of that. So therefore, instrument development in aerosol research is quite crucial. Um, so because you want to know is you want to get as much information on the particles as you as you can have so you would like to have the size the mass you want to know if they interact with water you might want to know the refractive index uh, ideally it would be nice to know the full chemical composition of the particles and then you would also know the sources where do they come from and how can you avoid them if you know they are harmful so here is just an illustration of, of a very different uh, types of um, aerosols that you call aerosols. This is a schematic of a molecule of Teflon. So this can be chain like it's very small. It's just a single molecule. It has like 1.4 nanometers in size. And this is actually an engineered particle. So this is metallic, uh, but you can see that you might also have like a large particle where on top are smaller particles and on top are even smaller particles and then you would like to find out uh, what this is and where it comes from. So um, measurements of aerosol particles can be quite uh, complex. And um, so in order to uh, gather information on the aerosols around us or, or the air, air quality in general, um, we are using uh, measurement stations uh, where typically many instruments are operated in parallel. And in order to run such a station, you need um, uh, quite a lot of resources. You need first the funding to get the instruments, which are expensive, but you then need also trained uh, personnel to, to maintain the instruments, to run them, to check the data, if the data is okay, uh, to process the data, to draw scientific conclusions. And all of this is of course very expensive. So you wouldn't have a measurement station everywhere around you. So um, you just have measurement stations at uh, specific locations and in between uh, you don't have necessarily that much data uh, to get. So the correct situation of uh, monitoring stations is that um, you, ha you have quite a lot in, for example, the United States. Uh, so all of these yellow pins would be some kind of monitoring stations. They might not have all every kind of aspect of, of air, air pollution monitoring, but uh, those are stations. But if you look at um, a wider global map, you see that there's a lot of gaps where you don't get uh, that much information. And this is directly linked 
uh, to the fact that these are very expensive um, to operate and to run. So um, there has been a major effort um, in the past years on making instruments more versatile, mobile and cost effective. And if you um, manage that, if you make the instruments smaller, but also more cost efficient, you might um, improve a lot the network of, in, of instrumentations that you have. So then you might have the opportunity to have um, some monitoring of the aerosol situation close to your house or close to your work or close to a school or so on. And that's, um, that's something that uh, would be very helpful, uh, even though, of course, all these small and lightweight instruments would not give you the full picture that a, a large monitoring station would give you, but they can definitely add to have a lot more information. So um, developing um, small um, cost-effective uh, sensors for air quality and also aerosols uh, has been something that's been done in the past. And there's, for example, optical particle sensors out there which are relatively small and relatively cheap and uh, they are, when you compare them with a reference instrument, they give you um, not exactly the same information, but they are correlating quite well uh, with uh, reference instruments. And uh, this is something which is very, very useful. And this is also being explored uh, further at the Cypress Institute. And there are some publications out there, and this is done uh, mostly by colleagues. But the problem of optical detection of particles is that there is a lower limit in uh, what kind of particles you can detect um, with, a, with a laser. And this is like if particles get uh, smaller than 500 nanometers or maybe 300 nanometers, then they're just not visible by the laser anymore. And as if you remember the graph uh, on the health effects, um, there I said, uh, that especially the small particles are the ones that are getting very deep in your lungs and are probably more harmful than the larger particles. So we want to know also what's happening with the smaller size, especially if we go for workplace monitoring or a health-related monitoring of aerosols. So how do you measure these small sizes if you cannot optically detect them? So how do you measure an invisible particle? And this is something which um, there's different approaches, but one of the most commonly used approach is that you try to charge this small, small particle. So you put a positive or a negative charge on the particle, and then you can manipulate um, them in an electric field, and you can predict how they would move in this electrical field. And this is related to their size, and therefore you can gather some information on the particle size. So this works in instruments that measure the electrical mobility, while, okay, this electrical mobility is something which is related to the size, and it works in a way that you can have uh, particles which are charged, and you have them in an airflow which would carry the particles just from this side uh, of the tube to this side of the tube. But if you also, in addition, um, apply an electric field between this plate and this plate, the particles would move from this side to this side, and depending on the size of the particles, they would reach the other side um, at a different location. So if this particle was smaller, it would be reaching here faster. If it was bigger, it would be reaching here a little bit later. So this is a little bit more uh, detailed schematic of uh, how this instrument would look like also. Um, so you can have configurations where you have a cylindrical design, so you would have it like a cylindrical condenser. So you have an inner cylindrical electrode and you have an outer cylindrical electrode and you can introduce your aerosols here. You have a flow that carries the particles down. You can have the outer electrode on ground and the inner one on a specific voltage. And then you can use this instrument as a filter where if you have many sizes of particles here, you filter out just a very narrow, narrow fraction of particles and they would exit the instrument and then you can count them and then you can get, uh, if, you, if you change the field uh, and you filter out one step after the other different sizes, you can get an information on how the size distribution of your aerosol particles is. 
And as I already mentioned before, this electrical mobility is related to the size. So basically you can um, talk about a, a size distribution from the results of these measurements. And this is a technology that goes uh, back uh, to the 60s. Uh, so this is the predecessor of mostly all the commercial uh, available in differential mobility analysis. This has been developed in um, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota in the, in the 1960s. Uh, and I just wanted to show this picture because we are talking about miniaturizing um, and cost-effective measurements uh, now. And you see this scale here, it's a little bit blurry this picture, but you can see the scale here is like half a meter. So you can see the first instrument, which was also the one, um, the commerce, commercial, um, uh, first commercial instrument was based on, uh, took up uh, basically a small room in type in, in, in the size. So, but um, I talked now about the, the cylinder where you can filter the particles, but this doesn't give you a full instrument. So if you want to build a full instrument, and uh, that's what you need to do in order to make a, a to apply it uh, in a scientific context, you need uh, a little bit more than just this filter. You need also a particle charger because particles need to be charged in order to be measured. You need the classifier, which is which is this cylinder, but you need then also a counter because you need to count for every um, size that you filter here, you need to count how many particles you have. And if you have all of this, then you get something like this, which is a size distribution. So you would know, okay, if, if I apply the voltage for this specific size, I get this kind of signal. And then, you know, you get the information about your aerosol that you want uh, to get. So, um, so in order to do this uh, with the project uh, that I'm presenting here, we needed to develop a charger. So it's something that uh, can charge the particles. Uh, and we needed to develop also a counter. And um, I'm not talking a lot more about the charger, but I want to say something about the counter. So um, the counter is something which also you have the problem that the particles typically are too small for optical detection. So how do you count the particles? And there's an instrument that uses a trick, which is very established also in aerosol research. Uh, and the trick is that you condense on your particles, uh, you condense some liquid and they grow into larger droplets, which then are large enough to be counted optically. So by this, effect you lose the information on the initial size of the particles but since if all the particles would grow you would just um, with a simple laser uh, optical detection uh, block you would be able to count uh, the particles and um, so this is what a state-of-the-art instrument looks like um, so this is what you have in field measurement stations uh, running and um, you can see it's not as large as the prototype that I showed you from the 60s, but it's still uh, quite heavy and large and especially very expensive. But of course, um, the development of making this instrument smaller and more lightweight um, had uh, gained some momentum lately. So especially in the past five years, also commercial companies put a lot of effort in developing uh, smaller um, instruments for the measurement of size distributions of uh, the smaller size range. And here are some exa examples of what kind of lightweight um, mobility measurements, electrical mobility measurements are, measurement instruments are out there. And uh, so you see you have from major companies, you have instruments that can cover um, the size range from about 10 uh, to 400 nanometers or 800 nanometers. They have scanning times in less than one minute and they're like nine kilograms for this one, but this one is only 3.3 kilograms. And it's very fast in scanning. So these are very, very useful instruments, but they're still uh, quite expensive. So they would still be, if you want to buy that, it would still be tens of thousands of euros to get that. So it's not something that you would just buy because you're curious about the air quality in your office or in your home or and so on. So um, 
our approach was to see if we could um, do some lightweight um, instrument, uh, which is at the same time also relatively cost efficient. And we tried, we wanted to see if 3D printing uh, could help with that. And uh, this is some work that goes back um, to, uh, I think, 2016, where we uh, looked into the possibility of um, doing this differential mobility analyzer, which is usually out of, uh, made out of stainless steel and quite heavy, uh, by using 3D printing. And this is the very first prototype that we did. This is uh, a one a little bit later. And um, actually, this shows that it's uh, working quite well, also if you compare it to a reference instrument. And it's working uh, very satisfactorily by reducing the weight uh, by like a factor of 10 and reducing the cost by also more than a factor of 10. So this would be 3,000 um, euros to build. Uh, even in your own machine shop, and this would be 150 euros, maybe, or between 50 and 150 euros uh, to build. So this is a major, major advantage in weight and in cost. So um, that's the goal was then to build a full instrument applying this technology. And one of the major advantages of 3D printing is that you can do something which is we call fast prototyping. So you can have um, a design that you do on your computer and then you print it and then you can test your prototype in a real um, experiment in, in your lab and then you can see, okay, this is working well, but this is not so wor working so well. And then you can have this feedback from testing and uh, update your prototype and improve the design, which is very difficult if you need to machine your devices, uh, you, you would uh, want to avoid that. And this is something that happened for the design of the charger for the instrument. So we had an initial design, but then we realized that uh, we need to open it more frequently because uh, the things that are inside would wear out over time. And then you just have uh, a new design which can be more easily opened and you just uh, can do that uh, relatively quickly if you know how to use the software and uh, do these kind of changes. But also if it's a simple design as for the charger, learning the software uh, of 3D printing is not so complicated and um, it can be done by the scientists themselves. If, if it's more complicated uh, design, then uh, the help of an experienced engineer on 3D printing is of course very, very useful. And that's what we also did. So we, we tried uh, to apply the technology for many different uh, um, configurations of differential mobility analyzer. This shows now uh, two types where we use, uh, where we build something which is called multi-outlet DMAs. So these are DMAs, um, so the column is called DMA. This, these are DMAs where you filter out at the same time three different sizes. Uh, and um, this can be this can be useful, for example, if you want to have a faster measurement, uh, which is, uh, for example, needed on airplanes or on fast moving platforms, or if your aerosol changes very rapidly uh, for some reason. And again, you see, okay, we 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 have our drawings, uh, we build them, and then you can test them in the lab, you can compare it to um, theoretical, what you would expect theoretically, and you can see, okay, it's working quite well, but uh, okay, I'm losing some particles that uh, should make it through the filter. And then you can decide, is it is it working well enough for the application I need, or do I need to put more effort into improving the prototype? And uh, while this cylindrical designs that I showed you now pictures from uh, in 3D printing are uh, very good in, in terms of cost efficiency and in terms of weight, they're still relatively large. So if you want to make something smaller, uh, you might want to change the design. And that's what we did. We also built some parallel plate DMAs where you see the, the picture here. And this would now be uh, basically the size of a a smartphone, a little bit thicker, but uh, from the size it would be comparable to, to a smartphone. 
And again, you can print it, you can test it in the lab, you can see does it work uh, the way you, you expect it to work, is it satisfactory, and then you can apply it in further testing and in the field and so on. And then uh, we had a company helping us with um, building the CPC. So the condensed, uh, the, the the condensing element where you grow the particles and then you have an optical detector. And again, on all these parts, we used uh, 3D printing where possible. You still need some peripheral parts um, that cannot be printed, uh, like, uh, and you need to, to have it connected to a computer and you need to have some data acquisition system. So in order to have a full instrument in a box, uh, it's, uh, quite tricky, but uh, we managed uh, to have now all the parts ready um, to use. So we have the charger, we have the um, DMA, where we can use different types of DMAs that we built, whatever the, is most useful, and you can have a CPC. And um, this would be then, uh, it's right now in a prototype version, but if you put it in a box, uh, it would have about a weight of five kilograms. Uh, if you need it to have it lower, you might uh, need to limit the weight a little bit in the peripheral parts, in the high voltage power supply and so on. Um, but uh, it's relatively lightweight and it can be built uh, relatively easily in the lab uh, for a low cost. And the advantage of this is then uh, that you can multiply this system so you can have several systems that you either operate in parallel, so next to each other. If you want to have a fast information of your aerosol and you don't have the time to scan over the entire range um, every time, or you can multiply it also to have a much uh, tighter network of instruments. And um, because of the reduced cost in for the price of uh, one of the commercial instruments, you could have maybe 10 of the small ones. And that would be already quite helpful uh, for, for the network. So um, the conclusion of the project is that um, it has, um, th this technology has a great potential to overcome uh, weight, size and cost limitations, uh, while the performance of the instrument uh, is not so much compromised. So the, the quality of the data can be maintained to a very high degree. Um, the small uh, parallel plate DMAs can be used as parts uh, for a fast in, uh, response instrument or, and fill some gaps for, of, of data that uh, you otherwise might lose if you're scanning uh, with more time needed. And this could lead uh, the, also the cost effectiveness of these um, instruments uh, could lead to a uh, much tighter network of monitoring for the small aerosol fraction size by using this uh, cheaper instruments. And 3D printing also has a very interesting aspect, I think, for future scientific instruments, which would be uh, something that you could call open hardware policies, or you could just, um, it could just develop into something where this, um, plans like this software plans that you do the, uh, on, on your computer, on an instrument uh, will become available, openly available, and then you could have anyone in the world who would have a printer could just copy this instrument and use it, and that could, of course, help uh, a lot to expand your network of instruments uh, in regions where right now it's difficult to have the instruments or uh, have just a lot of a lot more instruments around and and gather the data. And I think there is a great potential for that in, in the future. And we will see how it, how it evolves. So of course, a project like that is not possible to do uh, without the help of a lot of people. So I want to acknowledge here my colleagues, which are um, both, which are scientific um, and technical people that helped uh, doing this this project, but also, of course, the project uh, management support that we had. And of course, I want to also uh, acknowledge uh, the funding uh, agency. So this is a, 
a research promotion foundation project um, that was running over the past uh, almost two and a half years, uh, almost three years now. Uh, and uh, I want to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mesa, we would like to thank you for this insightful and interesting presentation of 3D printing and current state and your work on it. And also for the acknowledgement uh, of uh, everyone's support on the, on the project. Um, now we would like to welcome everyone and the audience for any questions you may have. Yes? Uh, Hello, Doctor. Yes. Yes, uh, I, um, I I wanted to uh, to ask. I'm not at all a um, a uh, sorry. I'm just being seen that my webcam is not showing me. Maybe now. Yes. Okay. So uh, the, I I'm not at all uh, an expert on these things, but the presentation was really really fascinating, and um, I was uh, you know I'm really curious to. About these three D printed instruments, um, I have uh, always been thinking that three D printing is mainly producing uh, some sort of plastic material. But I suppose that if you're doing this type of measurements, you need uh, conducting material. So um, I don't know if you can say a little bit about the materials that the three D printers can can use. Yes, actually, that's a very um, good point um, that I didn't I didn't mention. Um, yes, we are printing um, now plastic material that we coat uh, with a conductive paint uh, to make the, the parts that need to be conductive conductive. Uh, but also, uh, we explore now um, materials that you can print, which is also plastic, but there would be already on the on the fiber or on, on the resin some. Um, um, components inside that would make the plastic already conductive. So there is a lot of development in in this kind of of a pro, of, of um, material development for for making this three uh, D printing materials more versatile and especially for the conductivity. But the initially in the initial instruments we just uh, used paint, which is also kind of convenient because if you have like, apply like high voltages. Um, you want a certain surface to be conductive, but you want some other parts to be isolating, so because you don't want to have it on the outside. So that's quite useful because you can have a, the inner part of the cylinder conductive, but the outer is, is plastic, so you can touch it uh, freely, and that's quite useful. So, yeah, there's a lot going on, and I think we will see a lot more on printing different materials in the future and this will will uh, become very very useful uh, for experimentalists uh, I think uh, and it already is but it will it will become even more and just out of curiosity can you have 3d printers that outputs different materials in different parts of the of the instrument um, they could use. Uh, they could print a, a conductive part and a non-conductive part. Well, yes, um, because this is basically um, not depending on the printer so much, but on the on the material that, like you, you have this kind of cartridge that you put inside uh, your printer, and then you can have uh, for one part you use the the conductive one. It's basically like you can you can print in different colors. So then you have a different kind of thing that you put inside. And that's the same way that you could do like um, printing with one part would be the conductive one and one part would be an insulating one. And that's certainly possible, yes. Thanks. Thank you very much for the question. Any further questions? Uh, if not, then we can conclude this uh, lecture for today. And thank you everyone for your attention and time. Thank you, thank you. everyone as well. If you have any questions uh, after the presentation, you can reach me also on email or social media. Thank you very much.